sheriff says they found the body of a woman along the dirt road of 1441. Now, let me tell you, this morning, 19-year-old Stacy Lee Stites was reported missing and never arrived at work. But my personal opinion when I heard that she had been killed was that Fennell had done it immediately. And I know a number of people around here that felt the same way. And I believe the state knew about it. I believe the district attorney for Bastrop knew about it. I believe the sheriff's department knew about it. And I believe the Bastrop police department knew about it. And I do believe they covered that up. They did not want a fellow officer implicated. A Georgetown police sergeant is spending the night behind bars. Jimmy Fennell Jr. is accused of sexually assaulting a woman he detained. He put me back into the patrol car and told me that if I ever told anybody that when he got out of prison, he would hunt me down and he would kill me. Did Roberto Bayardo make missteps that hindered justice in some of the most high profile crimes? A man within days of execution now awaiting word of an appeal after Bayardo clarified his conclusions on when that woman died. Maria Bryant Fountain spoke with Fox 7 about the murder of her husband, Giddings police officer Gary Joe Bryant. He was gunned down on the job in 1996. My brother said Joe was working the other end in Giddings. Joe just knew as much or more than my brother did. And I think that's what happened to Joe. The man who oversaw the Reed investigation, Bastrop Sheriff Richard Hernandez, who also turned out to be a dirty cop and pled guilty to six felonies. There's a possibility that the police, they had him killed. The little click with David Hall, Nathan Lapham, Jimmy Fennell. And sometimes he gave his voice as he worked there also. And he walked by and he said, uh, Jimmy Fennell killed Stacy Sykes. And I was like, yeah. I believe every man has a conscience. And sooner or later, it will get the best of him and someone will come forward. says they found the body of a woman along the dirt road of 1441. Now, let me tell you, this morning, 19-year-old Stacy Lee Stites was reported missing and never arrived at work. In 2006, a small documentary film team helped expose how an innocent man ended up on Texas's death row. But my personal opinion when I heard that she had been killed was that Fennell had done it immediately. And I know a number of people around here that felt the same way. It soon became apparent that the case against Rodney Reed was not just a small town affair. And I believe the state knew about it. I believe the district attorney for Bastrop knew about it. I believe the sheriff's department knew about it. And I believe the Bastrop police department knew about it. And I do believe they covered that up. They did not want a fellow officer implicated. In the past 13 years, the evidence has continued to mount in favor of Rodney Reed's innocence. A Georgetown police sergeant is spending the night behind bars. Jimmy Fennell Jr. is accused of sexually assaulting a woman he detained. His guilty pleas today could play a major role in the appeal process of convicted murderer Rodney Reed. Key witnesses have recanted crucial testimony. Did Roberto Bayardo make missteps that hindered justice in some of the most high profile crimes? A man within days of execution now awaiting word of an appeal after Bayardo clarified his conclusions on when that woman died. Key law enforcement officials who oversaw the initial investigation have been charged and convicted for their own misconduct. The man who oversaw the Reed investigation, Bastrop Sheriff Richard Hernandez who also turned out to be a dirty cop and pled guilty to six felonies. In critical scientific medical evidence has been discovered that essentially exonerates Rodney Reed. She had been face down for five or more hours um, in one position before she was turned over to the new position. She was dead around midnight. She was already dead. Yet instead of exonerating Reed, or even retrying him under fair conditions, the Texas courts have decided to set a November 20th execution date for this year. State prosecutors are now asking to execute convicted murderer Rodney Reed. The amount of injustice wrought against Rodney Reed in this case is impossible to measure. 
and the fact that the state continues to seek his execution defies common sense and human decency. This documentary series is intended to highlight the evidence and the witnesses that prove Rodney's innocence in hopes that Texas halts the execution of this innocent man. On the morning of May 6, 1998, Dr. Roberto Bayardo, Travis County, Texas medical examiner, told a lie. He was testifying during the trial of Rodney Reed for the capital murder of a local 19-year-old girl, Stacy Stites. When asked by Special Prosecutor Lisa Tanner approximately what time he believed the victim to have died, he answered around 3 a.m. on April 23, 1996. A few years later, I asked him how he came up with that specific time at trial. In your trial testimony, you, you said that time of the death was around 3 a.m. Do you remember how you could have came to that conclusion? We know when she was last seen and we know when she, the body was found, so we have a precise time. So Dr. Biardo's testimony regarding the victim's time of death was based on the word of Stacy's live-in boyfriend and fiance and local police officer, Jimmy Fennell, who told police she would have left their apartment around 3 a.m. to go to work. Dr. Bayardo's estimated time of death was not based on any actual medical science. Well, usually the first question the police officer, the investigators want to know is when did she die because that will influence the investigation of uh, whom to interview and whether who's telling the truth and who isn't. This is something that all medical examiners and coroners learn in, immediately is that there's certain changes in the body that indicate how long somebody's been dead. Dr. Michael Bodden is one of the nation's foremost authorities in forensic pathology. He was a former chief medical examiner for New York City and he was appointed the chairman of the United States Forensic Panel that investigated the deaths of John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King. He has performed over 20,000 autopsies throughout his decades-long career. After reviewing the autopsy and crime scene video, Dr. Baden, along with two other renowned pathologists, concluded that the victim had died much earlier than Dr. Bayardo had testified, most likely well before midnight on April 22nd. In my opinion, to a reasonable degree of medical certainty, she was dead before midnight of the day, uh, the next day that she was found. She was dead around midnight, she was already dead. Experts also noted it appeared obvious that the body had been moved at least three to four hours after the murder by looking at telltale signs of the body's condition. The appearance of uh, Stacy Seitz's body at the scene where she was found uh, later that afternoon, around three o'clock that afternoon, which shows a pinkish red color on the on the, front areas of her body uh, that are due to uh, what's called lividity, the settling of blood by gravity after death. And in this instance, there was fixed lividity on the front of her body, and that would indicate that she had been face down for five or more hours. Um, in one position before she was turned over into the new position. Lividity, or the gravitational pooling of red blood cells, is a basic forensic indicator of what happened to the body after death. Yet neither rookie field analyst Karen Blakely nor Dr. Bayardo made any mention of this evidence, which is clearly obvious in the crime scene tape. This is the right hand, and it shows that she's laying face up and hand up but the lividity is inappropriate because that only developed when the hand was down, when the hand and forearm were in a downward position. So it would uh, support the, uh, uh, the conclusion that she was laying face down, the hand and the arm were face down for at least four or five hours in order for this to still be there. One can see in the tips of the fingers pale, pale whiteness in the second, third, fourth, and fifth fingers. And that's because at the time she was laying face down elsewhere, 
the fingers were against an object which pressed out the lividity so it gives some in, in information as to her being face down with a hand down uh, for many hours before she was moved to this position. And finally, the experts agreed that the type and amount of bodily fluids found on the floor of the pickup truck that Stacy and Jimmy Fennell shared, which was found abandoned eight miles away in a local high school parking lot, was indicative of her being placed and kept in that truck three or four hours after she had been killed. And that mucoid type fluid would have come out of her nose and mouth, which is an early part of the decomposition process after we die. This takes three or four hours to develop under these conditions she was in. That time period would make Jimmy Fennell the one and only person who could have killed her. For he testified that he and Stacy were alone in their apartment from 8 p.m. until 3 a.m. on the night that she was killed. The earlier time of death and the proof of movement of the body hours after the murder completely exonerates Rodney Reed, who, by the state's own admission and Jimmy Fennell's testimony, would not have had access to the victim for that long or anywhere near that time period. None of this basic forensic analysis was ever completed by Dr. Bayardo. But without credible medical testimony or an expert of his own, Rodney Reed was at the mercy of Bayardo's lie. Were you surprised if I told you the defense never called a medical examiner in this case for their own expert? I mean, they called me, so I was there. I mean, they didn't call any extra, another medical examiner, another expert on this case. No, it doesn't surprise me. Counties, if these are poor people, the counties don't, don't have the money to pay for, for, for experts. The circumstances surrounding Bayardo's involvement in the autopsy of Stacy Stites indicates that he may well have been incentivized to testify in favor of the prosecution. We found making money could be at the root of the problem. A 2016 investigative report by Austin's KXAN news team uncovered a decades-long scheme by Bayardo to increase his salary by conducting out-of-county autopsies and pocketing the proceeds. Stacy Stites was one of those autopsies. An analysis of Bayardo's near three decades in office shows he consistently performed between 395 and 823 autopsies a year. Over time, Bayardo raked in around $2.6 million, performing autopsies for 45 other counties. To protect his lucrative arrangement, it makes sense that Bayardo would bend his testimony to support the prosecutors who work for the same county that paid him his extra fees. Bayardo specifically testified he did not financially benefit from Stacy Stites' autopsy, though records indicate he clearly did. Despite Bayardo's lack of credibility and his conflict of interests and his own signed statement that now recants his original time of death estimate, Texas courts have refused to even consider the alternative evidence brought forth by Dr. Baden. Dr. Baden, free to leave. Yeah, I'll read some ideas more importantly. This is important. Thank you, Your Honor. And so Bayardo's lie still stands as a key fact in the case against Rodney Reed that now has him on the verge of execution by the state of Texas. It was a simple lie from a medical examiner that went unchallenged by an overmatched and underprepared defense team but it was a lie that single-handedly covered up the many lies that preceded it in the case against Mr. Reed. Such as the lies of the prosecution, who failed to hand over crucial DNA evidence that placed other police officers and friends of Jimmy Fennell at the scene of the crime. And the lies of the lead investigator, Rocky Wardlow, who covered for Jimmy Fennell by not checking the apartment he shared with Stacy and returning the pickup truck before adequate testing could be completed. And finally, it covered up the biggest lie of all. Specifically, Jimmy Fennell's denial when asked if he was involved in the murder of Stacy Stites. A lie that now has been proven beyond any reasonable doubt by irrefutable scientific facts. I, I knew Stacy. she was a year or two older than me. I worked at the HEB in Bastrop. We were talking about her, her engagement ring and I was like, oh, are you so excited to get married? And she said she really wasn't so excited to get married and 
quickly followed that with saying that she was actually sleeping with a black guy named Rodney. I just didn't realize that what I had to say meant so much in this case. We were talking about her, her engagement ring, and I was like, oh, are you so excited to get married? And she said she really wasn't so excited to get married, and quickly followed that with saying that she was actually sleeping with a black guy named Rodney. Okay. Start with your name and your employment with HEB and the time frame that happened. In. Okay. My name's Alicia Slater, and I worked at the HEB in Bastrop from 90, 1995 to 1996 before I graduated high school. I, I knew Stacy C. She was a year or two older than me and um, didn't work in the same department or anything. I was just a, the bagger and, and the cart girl outside mostly, um, but... We, we just knew each other through work, and we had lunch together in the break room quite often. Proof of a pre-existing consensual sexual relationship between Rodney Reed and Stacy Stites would be a key exonerating piece of evidence in his case. For proving the relationship would provide a reasonable explanation to why a small amount of Reed's sperm was found on the victim. In fact, in a 2012 denial of Rodney Reed's appeal, Texas Court of Criminal Appeals Judge Andrew W. Austin wrote that Reed's claim of a consensual relationship is effectively the beginning and end of his assertion of innocence. Austin further stated that all witnesses to this relationship had been friends and associates of Rodney Reed and not of Stacy Stites and therefore were unreliable. Finally, Austin wrote that because Reed's claim that he had an affair with Stacy Stites does not have credible evidentiary support, his claims of actual innocence is doomed. But what if such a witness existed? There was one instance where we were having lunch in the break room together, and it was just the two of us, and um, she pretty much was confiding in me. We were talking about her, her engagement ring, and I was like, oh, are you so excited to get married? And she said she really wasn't so excited to get married, and quickly followed that with saying that she was actually sleeping with a black guy named Rodney, and that she was, you know, not sure what, her fiance would do if he found out and she had to be pretty careful about it so she wasn't really excited about getting married because she was sleeping with a black dude named Rodney she said. According to Rodney Reed's first lawyer Jimmy Brown there were multiple co-workers at Stacy's grocery store job who knew and witnessed a relationship between she and Rodney Reed. On everything that Rodney told me that happened I was able to verify. In a 2015 affidavit Jimmy Brown states when he returned to the store a week later, those same witnesses were unwilling to speak with him under a presumed threat from the Bastrop police. Witness intimidation and threat were two of the main reasons Rodney Reed's lawyers had difficulty establishing the relationship during the original trial. However, since then, 20 different people have come forward with their personal knowledge that the relationship indeed existed, including Alicia Slater, who moved to California shortly after the murder and did not realize until recently how important her information was to the case. At the time, I didn't speak up because I did know I had something to lose. I had my whole family still in Bastrop. I didn't want to, you know, have anything happen to them because I'm implicating a cop from the next, you know, town over. So, you know, I, I had big regret that I didn't come out in the beginning and say anything. And then I just didn't realize that what I had to say meant so much in this case. Because if that's what it came down to, yeah, they were having an affair. She told me. I thought more people knew about it as well. So, you know, it's, I 100% remember everything about that conversation. And she, she was scared in a way. And then she was also super happy because she's sleeping with this guy named Rodney, you know. And I didn't know who Rodney was. Didn't know who Jimmy was. So, you know, I have zero... <laughs> affiliation to either one of them. I'm not a family member. I don't, all I knew was Stacy from work. And all I know is what she told me. And that's all I can, you know, I stand by my word with that. The fact that a 19 year old girl would not want to volunteer information that could implicate a local police officer in a murder is highly understandable. And yet it underscores the major issue of witness intimidation in the case against Rodney Reed. So I just realized when I heard that it was still happening and that he was actually had an execution date set, I felt like it's now or never I need to say something because if that was the only thing that convicted him, and I had no idea about any of the other stuff, you know, 
if just that was a reason why he was convicted, then that's not true. You know, and I, I needed to say something because Stacy physically sat there and told me she was sleeping with him. I never saw them together. I never saw him, but I knew what she told me. So I knew it, it had some implication in the case. In addition to Alicia Slater, fellow HEB grocery store worker Leroy Yabera has stated he actually saw Reed visiting Stites at the store. And Stacy Stites' cousin, Buddy Horton, has sworn he saw the two together at a local Dairy Queen a few months before her murder. I just wanted to help in whatever way I can. So that still stands, you know, if I needed to come in and be a credible witness that had nothing to do with any of them, and I just happened to work with Stacy and just happened to talk to her in the break room, you know, that's, that's definitely something I'd be willing to do to, to help this, so. And, and you'd also be willing to take a polygraph test? Yes, oh yeah. I would be willing to take a polygraph test for everything I've stated. And yet, instead of pursuing this vital piece of evidence and seeking the truth, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals have completely ignored Alicia Slater's sworn affidavit. State prosecutors are now asking to execute convicted murderer Rodney Reed. With medical experts now agreeing Stacy Stites was not sexually assaulted. There was no evidence, absolutely no evidence in the autopsy or the findings of the photographs that she had been sexually assaulted. And multiple eyewitnesses verifying a pre-existing relationship between Stacy Stites and Rodney Reed, there remains absolutely no physical evidence linking Reed to the crime that he is now set to die for. Alternatively, there is an overwhelming abundance of evidence implicating Stacy Stites' police officer boyfriend, Jimmy Fennell, as well as clear indications of a cover-up by fellow police officers, investigators, and prosecutors to keep that truth from ever being known. The existence of a cover-up and those involved in it could be a key contributing factor as to why the state has refused to acknowledge the truth in this case, despite convincing and credible evidence of Reed's innocence. Which leaves the question, how broken is our justice system that it would move forward and knowingly execute an innocent man? And what could be done now to stop them? Jimmy Fennell Jr. is accused of sexually assaulting a woman he detained. He just kept telling me to shut up. He asked me to dance for him. Since then, there have been a lot of things that I've learned in that 20 years or heard about that have made me wonder if Rodney was framed. I remember after driving by, I thought, man, that guy could have killed Stacy just by the way he's acting. I have questions now about whether Rodney was really guilty. In the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals' most recent denial of relief for Rodney Reed, they determined his lawyers failed to prove that no rational juror could have found him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Yet, at least one original juror from the trial has publicly stated on national television that she now has those exact doubts. Since then, there have been a lot of things that I've learned in that 20 years or heard about that have made me wonder if Rodney was framed. One thing she may have learned is the existence of a lab report indicating the DNA presence of two police officers on two beer cans found near the body. One officer, David Hall, was Jimmy Fennell's patrol partner and neighbor. The other officer was Ed Samella, who was an investigator on the Stacy Stites case and ended up dead six months later due to a suspicious gunshot to the head. Of course, this DNA report never made it to Rodney Reed's defense team, and the jury was never made aware of it. Maybe the juror learned that Jimmy Fennell had bragged during his police training class that if he ever discovered his girlfriend cheating, he would strangle her with a belt so he wouldn't leave any fingerprints. Or maybe the juror heard about one of the many stories of Fennell's uncontrollable anger, such as the one witnessed by former Bastrop County Jailer Shane Wallace. I remember one day I was going to look at the field, and Jimmy Fennell was standing at the edge of the road with a Hispanic girl. He, I mean, he was having the most intense argument with her, and she was standing there taking it. And I remember after driving by, I thought, man, that guy could have killed Stacy just by the way he's acting. I mean, he's angry enough right now that he could have done it, just looking at the way he did, his mannerisms and his behavior. Perhaps the juror heard about the affidavit from the woman who started dating Fennell three months after the murder, 
who claimed Fennell stalked and screamed obscenities at her for months after they broke up. She also claims he called all black people by the N-word. He pulled over and harassed future boyfriends and made her scared for herself and her family. This woman claimed she filed a police report over Fennell's harassment, which would have been required to be turned over to Rodney Reed's defense team and would have been admissible at trial to impeach Fennell's character. However, Giddings police say the report was lost and Reed's lawyers were never made aware of Fennell's frightening misconduct right prior to the trial. Or maybe the juror heard that the Giddings Police Department and Jimmy Fennell were sued by a local man who claimed in February 1996, just a month before Stacy Stites murder, Jimmy Fennell, while on duty, threatened his life with a loaded gun pressed to his head for absolutely no reason. This lawsuit was removed from court two months prior to Rodney Reed being arrested and its resolution has been obscured from public record. Perhaps the juror heard of Jimmy Fennell's ex-wife who confided in a co-worker that she was nervous of Fennell's jealousy and temper. She had suspicions of Fennell's involvement in the Stites murder and she showed up to work with bruises on her face claiming they were caused by Fennell in a fit of anger. Or most likely, the juror heard about the 10 year prison sentence Fennell received for raping a woman he had taken into custody. Jimmy Fennell Jr. is accused of sexually assaulting a woman he detained. This victim was courageous enough to come forward, press charges, and be interviewed on national television about the violent crime. He just kept telling me to shut up. He asked me to dance for him. And I told him no. And when I told him no, he got mad. And he grabbed me and slammed me up against the back of his car where the trunk is. I kept telling him to stop, but he just told me to shut up that I knew I liked it. And then if I told anybody that he'd hunt me down when he got out of prison and kill me. This victim's courage to come forward empowered many other victims of Fennell's sexual crimes to contact authorities, including a woman who claimed in the spring of 2007, Fennell took her into custody, strip searched her, and drove her to a secluded dirt road where he raped her. Another victim in August 2007 claimed Fennell planted drugs on her, pushed her into nearby bushes, and requested that they meet up later for sex in order for her to avoid jail or having her children taken away from her. And many other women came forward, mostly poor and with criminal backgrounds. And though investigators found their claims to be credible and consistent, Georgetown police did not bring any additional charges against Fennell for these accusations, and the true number of his victims will never be known. It's hard to tell exactly what new information has given the juror doubts, and equally difficult to discern why the Texas courts have not been swayed by such an obvious pattern of violent behavior, and instead have opted to move forward with an execution in this case, despite such serious concerns. Now, the man who was originally the person of interest in the murder of Stacey Stites will be released on parole next Friday. Jimmy Fennell is finishing a 10-year sentence for an unrelated crime of kidnapping and improper sexual activity with a person in custody. Additional evidence pointing to Fennell includes the victim's clipped fingernails, a method used to remove forensic evidence that would have been known by a police officer, and a staged crime scene indicating the attacker knew the victim and wanted her to be found, and the fact that Jimmy Fennell surreptitiously closed the bank account that he shared with Stacy Stites on the morning of her disappearance hours before she was found dead. And finally, the two failed polygraph tests, which indicated Fennell lied when he asked if he was involved in the murder of Stacy Stites. After the second failed test, Fennell pled the fifth and requested an attorney. Another critical fact kept from the jurors when deciding Rodney Reed's fate. A so former Georgetown police officer released from prison after serving nine and a half years for kidnapping and raping a woman he'd arrested. Imagine how much more evidence may have been recovered tying Fennell to the murder had lead investigator Rocky Wardlow actually done his job and searched the apartment that Jimmy Fennell and Stacy Stites shared. There's always something that doesn't get done and searching her apartment was that thing here. Um, I wish they would have searched her apartment. I think in hindsight, they wish they would have searched the apartment. But he didn't, and instead forfeited a key opportunity to gather forensic evidence from the location she was last seen alive, and we now know she was most likely killed. 
Rocky Wardlow also failed to fully process the abandoned pickup truck, especially the biological evidence found on the front floorboard noted by investigators that would have confirmed Stacy's earlier time of death, thus exonerating Reed. Instead, Wardlow returned the truck to Jimmy Fennell three days later, who sold it immediately to a local dealership. And finally, Wardlow failed to fully interview or properly document interviews with key witnesses close to the victim, including neighbor and close friend of Stacy, Carla Hall, who spent the whole evening before the murder with Stacy and who has come forth and stated on multiple occasions, including this 2015 Facebook Messenger chat with Giddings resident Wendy Wallace, that she was awoken at 3.30 a.m. on the night of the murder and seeing Stacy Stites' mother's car, which she knew Stacy and Jimmy also shared, being driven through the front yard of her mobile home, a vital piece of information that directly implicates Fennell, who testified he was at home sleeping at this time, and possible other co-conspirators while completely exonerating Rodney Reed. In fact, recently discovered police notes, whose authors remain unknown, indicates that an officer confirmed this very same story with Carla Hall shortly after the murder, but her statement never made it in official police reports, and Carla Hall, who was one of the last people to see Stacy Stites alive, was never called by prosecutors or the defense at Reed's original trial. The question is not whether Rocky Wardlow was covering up for Jimmy Fennell's crime, but why? How could Rodney Reed ever expect justice when the police in charge of the investigation were manipulating the evidence from the very beginning? And how could the state, in good conscience, execute a man with all of the extensive evidence implicating another suspect, documented jurors doubt? I have questions now about whether Rodney was really guilty. And so many critical questions concerning the integrity of the police who investigated the case. It's almost as if the state is more afraid of facing the truth than they are of carrying out an actual wrongful execution. But what if a new witness statement were to emerge that revealed that Jimmy Fennell had made arrangements to substantially financially benefit from Stacy Stites death? Would they listen then? On May 4th, 1998, the victim's mother, Carol Stites, testified about the day before her daughter was murdered. She testified that she had become depressed about the upcoming wedding between her daughter and Jimmy Fennell. At the trial, she blames herself and her nervous condition for the wedding anxiety. However, a closer look at police notes, witness statements, and Carol Stites' own handwritten journal entries indicate the relationship between Stites and Fennell was fraught with jealousy and suspicion, a key dynamic that was never conveyed to jurors at the original trial. The first evidence of conflict within the relationship is Stacy's co-worker, Alicia Slater. She said she really wasn't so excited to get married and quickly followed that with saying that she was actually sleeping with a black guy named Rodney and that she was, you know, not sure what her fiancé would do if he found out and she had to be pretty careful about it. And now we have a new statement from Carla Hall, who was married to David Hall, Jimmy Fennell's patrol partner on the Giddings Police Department at the time of the murder. Carla Hall was also a close friend of Stacy Stites and a neighbor that lived about 200 yards from the apartment that Jimmy Fennell and Stacy Stites shared. Additionally, she spent the evening before the murder with Stacy, and besides Carol Stites and Jimmy Fennell, was one of the last people to see the victim alive. Stacy and I had several conversations. She was always at the house. They lived next door to us. There is one conversation that does stick in my head, which I thought was strange. She was sitting on the armrest of my recliner, and she was sitting there leaning up against the back of it, and she just kind of made an off-the-wall comment about, you know, I have a friend, I met a friend, and if 
Jimmy ever found out, he would kill me. And that's where the conversation ended because the men folk came inside the house and she didn't want to discuss it anymore. I never got a chance to question her about it. I just thought that if she wanted me to know more, she would tell me more. Do you remember when that conversation occurred? I want to say a week or two before. I don't recall the exact date. Shockingly, Carla Hall was never called to testify at Rodney Reed's original trial. And now, Carla Hall claims she was never even interviewed by investigators following Stacy's death. I know I didn't talk to any law enforcement officers about it. They never came and questioned me. They never, <clears throat> never once brought it up at all. You don't recall any sort of interviews with any investigators? I had no interviews with any investigators at all. Do you think you would have testified at the, t at the time that Stacy made that comment to you prior to her death, if you would have been called to trial? I would have brought it up and mentioned it had they either brought me to trial or at least came in and interviewed me about the day before and the events leading up. But Carla Hall was not called to testify at the trial. And once again, key witness testimony was kept from jurors who were deciding Rodney Reed's guilt or innocence. However, recovered police notes from the investigation back up Carla's account, indicating trouble within Stacy Stites and Jimmy Fennell's relationship. Saturday, April 20th, two days before the murder, police notes indicate Carol told them there was a fight over the details of the wedding. Carol's journal indicates the following night on April 21st, Fennell's rude behavior upset her and she became depressed about the upcoming wedding. On the night of the murder, on April 22nd, Carol Stites wrote that Fennell's behavior again upset her to the point where she questioned whether Stacy should consider backing out of the wedding before it was too late. To which Stacy ominously replied, you don't know what stress is. Finally, soon after the murder on April 23rd, another uncovered police note indicates Carol Stites told investigators Fennell and her daughter argued the night before the homicide and pointed out that Fennell was jealous of everyone. Who Fennell may have been jealous of is unclear, but the candidates are many. First, there was Greg Corner, the father of the daughter Stacy had when she was 15 years old and put up for adoption. Police reports indicate that Stacy Stites had stayed in contact with Greg Corner up until the time of her death. Another potential target of Fennell's jealousy could have been Jerry Ormond, a married man who was carrying out an affair with Stacy around the time she met Fennell. In fact, Fennell fingered Jerry Ormond as a suspect to investigators and also pointed suspicion at former boyfriends John Kirby and Jeremiah Smith. Yet another boyfriend who may have concerned Fennell was John Lestovica, who had enlisted in the military, was stationed in California, but according to Stacy Stites' co-worker, had planned to come back to visit her. Unbeknownst to Fennell, two other former boyfriends of the victim listed in police reports include Robert Campion and Marshall Farrell. Still, another object of Fennell's jealousy could have been Glenn Wright Jr. Glenn Wright's mother, Margaret Wright, called investigators months after the murder and told them her son had been seeing Stacy Stites in the weeks leading up to the murder and feared the relationship had been discovered by Fennell. Investigations. Yes, sir. I think Stacy was having a like, a, a son. Okay. I'm almost positive of it. Um, I think he got him right under you. I think they got caught. We've all kind of assumed that. Who has a, a motive for this? Who has a motive? Uh-huh. Well, at this point, the boyfriend does. That's right. That's a prime suspect. That's the right. person that we're trying to find is a liaison. Margaret Wright, at first, refuses to provide her or her son's name for fear of what might happen. Mm -hmm. No, I can't give it to you. Why? Because I think he'd be railroaded. You've got a cop and you've got somebody else. No. Nobody's going to be real, really. I can promise you that. Let me say this. For the longest time, we've had our suspicions. Okay? Yeah. I, I think she was having one little last flame. She never gave it a, a second thought about um, doing away with her marriage. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I think she was having a last flame. She never gave it a second thought. 
Glenn Wright Jr. and all of Stacey Stites' other former boyfriends were investigated and cleared. And then you have Rodney Reed, who has 20 different people that have come forward to verify his relationship with Stacey Stites and one witness who confirms Fennell had suspicions and actually confronted Rodney Reed and his cousin about it. Two weeks before uh, Stacey Stites' murder, me and Rodney, we were walking down Hill Street. This car, he just come flying up. Then he just came to a stop. He told Rodney, he called that Rodney's name three times. Hey, Rodney, I know it's you, Rodney. But he got out of the car, Fennell got out of the car. The passenger, I don't know who he was. He, he was sitting there quiet and stuff by the car. And Fennell came over there, started telling Rodney, uh, he know that about him and Stacy and so forth, so forth. At first, I thought he was gonna shoot Rodney. You know, the way he got up out of the car. But it wasn't like that. You know, he was just having words. But he told Rodney, what made me mad and hurt me, he told Rodney, you gonna pay. So I, we thought, we took it as a threat. Chris Aldridge, who was also Rodney Reed's alibi on the night of the murder, was never called to testify at the original trial. Instead, Fennell, under oath at trial, claimed he and Stacy had no ongoing conflicts at the time of her murder, a statement we now know is verifiably untrue. Yet this false narrative has been perpetuated by Stacy Stites' half-sister Deborah Oliver in interviews with the local press. They were very happy together. They were looking forward to getting married. Um, and never have we thought that Jimmy was guilty of murdering my sister ever. Yet recently, uncovered handwritten notes attributed to Stacy Stites' sister indicate the family had deep suspicions of Fennell after the murder, including questioning his demeanor and behavior at the funeral, noting that he was acting paranoid after the murder, and wondering why he refused to return phone calls from a private investigator the family had hired to look into the case. Yet, during his trial testimony, Fennell claimed he did not recall the private investigator ever trying to get in touch with him, a claim we now know to be another lie. Such information would have been vital evidence for a jury to hear before sentencing another man to die for Stacy Stites' murder, but they didn't. Instead, jurors were left with the impression that the relationship and upcoming wedding were trouble-free, which we now know to be completely untrue. So why would Stacy Stites stay committed to marrying Jimmy Fennell despite her fears? A clue may lie in a recently recovered police note from an interview with the victim's friend, Jeremiah Smith, a former boyfriend who had visited with Stites a couple weeks before her death. According to police notes, Stites confided in Smith that she had suffered a miscarriage in late February or early March of 1996, about two months after she moved in with Fennell and a month and a half before she was killed. Nowhere else in police notes or trial testimony is Stacy Stites' pregnancy mentioned again, a confusing omission over such a pertinent detail. Did Stacy Stites become pregnant, and did that precipitate the decision for Stites and Fennell to marry so suddenly? And if she was pregnant, was Stites sure of the identity of the father? And could this question have been the cause of increased tension between her and Jimmy Fennell? And still, yet another critical piece of evidence has emerged that was not available for jurors to see. In a letter dated July 25, 2019, sent to the presiding judge in Rodney Reed's case, a longtime local insurance agent whose identity we are protecting per her request claims she sold Stacy Stites a life insurance policy soon before her murder. The agent writes, when Stites questioned the necessity of the policy, given her young age, Fennell responded with the agent present, if I ever catch you messing around on me, I will kill you, and no one will ever know it was me that killed you. A stunning exchange the agent remembers clearly to this day. Confirmation as to whether the policy was actually purchased and whether or not Jimmy Fennell was the beneficiary of this policy is still to be determined. CC'd on this letter was Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton, current Texas Governor Greg Abbott, current Bastrop District Attorney Brian Gertz, and presiding judge Doug Shaver. With this information in hand, officials chose to move forward with Rodney Reed's execution date, unmoved by such potentially exonerating evidence. And finally, just days ago, 
On October 3rd, 2019, another key witness has come forward with damning evidence of Fennell's guilt. Former Lee County Sheriff's Deputy Jim Clampett has now signed a sworn affidavit that states, while attending Stacy Stites' funeral back in 1996, he heard Fennell say to Stacy Stites' dead body, you got what you deserved. It shocked him at the time and it has bothered him ever since. Clampett states he finally came forward with this information because if he didn't, he would not be able to live with himself. Cryptically, Clampett suggests officials inquire with former Lee County Deputy and current Lee County Sheriff Rodney Meyer and former Texas Ranger and lead investigator on the case, Rocky Wardlow, for more information. The investigation continues as the execution date nears. I would say without hesitation that this is one of the clearest unequivocal cases of gross, gross misjudgment of travesty of justice that I've ever seen. You can argue about a lot of cases, and Dr. Phil, you and I have talked about some of these. In this case, there simply is no argument. The state had a weak case against Rodney Reed. They lacked witnesses and a motive, and they relied on a scientifically impossible timeline to link Reed to the crime based on the condition of the body and physical evidence, which indicates the murder occurred well before Rodney Reed could even have had the opportunity. There were absolutely no fingerprints, hairs, or biological evidence from Rodney Reed found in the truck that prosecutors allege Stacy Stites was violently abducted from. The only fingerprints in that vehicle belonged to Stacy and, and her boyfriend. So where's Rodney? Why isn't his fingerprints on the steering wheel anywhere on the vehicle? There were no footprints or fingerprints found at the crime scene or on any of the many items recovered and tested in this case. Then when you look at the body, Stacy's nails were cut. It's almost like somebody went out of their way to make sure that any DNA that was possibly there was gone. We, who else would know that except somebody maybe in the law enforcement business? This is typical of a staged crime scene. In fact, all prosecutors had and all they could rely on is one single piece of evidence to tie Rodney Reed to the murder of Stacy Stites. DNA from sperm recovered from the victim. But even this evidence, which Reed explains by a consensual encounter with Stacy Stites about 24 hours before her murder, is so tainted by improper procedures, undocumented results, and false and misleading testimony that it raises even more questions about the ethical and professional conduct of the prosecutors and state witnesses. The first mistake by investigators was to process the body of the victim at the crime scene rather than in a controlled medical examiner's office or lab. The, the taking of swabs have to be done on very controlled conditions with a lot of light on an autopsy table uh, to make sure one gets only the vaginal uh, semen and separately the anal, anything in the anus. Dr. Joseph Warren, a 30-year veteran of forensic science and serology, agrees. I don't like the fact that the tests were done in the field or the samples were collected in the field. I think they sh probably should have been collected at autopsy and then sent over to the lab and done inside a laboratory. While the video appears to show DPS serologist Karen Blakely conducting an acid phosphatase test on the vaginal swabs from the victim and her underwear, which would turn the samples purple in the presence of semen, both results appear to be clear or negative for the presence of spermatozoa. Yet Blakely later testified her result was a two plus out of four, or a little on the weak side of medium. The fact that you, they got a moderate, what, what, what they call a moderate reaction, which is a two plus reaction, moderate reaction, does lend that air, there was some uh, degradation occurring. Could have been placed there, the semen, you know, a couple of days prior to the actual crime itself. The field notes taken by serologist trainee Javier Flores were never documented in an official report and were never presented as evidence to jurors. Critically, Karen Blakely testified at trial that upon returning that night to the DPS laboratory in Austin, she created a lab slide from her vaginal swabs and on it, she testified that she found three intact sperm, sperm with head and tail. However, 
There is no mention of this finding in any of her reports or notes. This slide, or a photographic representation of it, was never entered into evidence or presented to the jury, a suspicious omission of the state's one and only piece of evidence, which jurors never saw and Rodney Reed's defense never challenged. You could have brought in the slide themselves for further examination or to present as evidence. It just depends whether they were whether they requested by the state or not. The importance of Karen Blakely testifying that she found intact sperm cannot be overstated. When prosecutor Lisa Tanner asked Karen Blakely about the significance of finding intact sperm, she incorrectly cited a 1981 medical paper that said the outside length of time that intact sperm can be found is only 26 hours. However, the paper that Karen Blakely cites actually listed and referred to other studies which had documented cases of up to 72 hours for finding intact sperm misinforming the jury on this key fact. Intact sperm can be seen days and weeks after the death, um, at least three or four days after death. Yet Lisa Tanner would use the false testimony of Karen Blakely's incorrect timeline repeatedly throughout the trial as proof that Rodney Reed was the killer. How could he have not killed her when his semen got into her body at the time of her death? In April 30th, 2018, 20 years after the trial, Texas DPS Crime Lab Director Brady Mills finally acknowledged the limitations to Blakely's testimony and pointed out the errors she made in misstating the scientific research. The testimony at the time given at the original trial was incorrect about the spermatozoa not remaining viable beyond 24 hours spermatozoa can remain viable for 72 hours. Of course, jurors were never provided this vital correction. After the body of the victim was improperly processed by Karen Blakely, it was delivered to the Travis County Medical Examiner's Office to be examined by Robert Bayardo. Bayardo's autopsy report indicates that the victim's vaginal area was intact and free of injury. He also reports that the victim's rectal area is intact and also free of injury. He reports he finds a few spermatozoa on a vaginal swab slide, which, like Karen Blakely's slide, has never been produced as evidence. And Bayardo reports that rectal smears are negative for spermatozoa. Yet critically, at the trial, Bayardo actually lies to jurors and tells them that in fact he did find spermatozoa on rectal smears in direct contradiction to his own autopsy and toxicology reports. Tests that were done by Dr. Biardo did not show any um, evidence of uh, semen in the, in the anus. And then when he testified that even though the autopsy report said no semen, that there were some sperm heads that he saw. Bayardo would continue to contradict his own findings under examination by prosecutor Lisa Tanner throughout the trial, describing what he initially reported in his autopsy as abrasions or irritation of the victim's anus as lacerations defined as a torn or jagged cut during his trial testimony. A critical difference in terminology that should not be interchanged by a trained pathologist under oath. Lisa Tanner continued to use the word laceration to describe the injury and later asks Bayardo about the rectal tearing of the victim, significantly advancing the degree of the injury without correction by Bayardo or trial judge Harold Towsley or objection from Reed's defense. There's no injury there at all. There's dilatation, it's dilated uh, more than normal but that's normal for a dead body. There was no evidence of penetration, no evidence really of any tears. They, they were irregular, the skin is a little irregular around the anus and sometimes it can be misinterpreted as a tear when it isn't a tear. And there's no blood and no evidence of uh, injury to the anus taken at the time of the autopsy. Experts also point out a small amount of Reed's DNA later reportedly recovered by a DPS investigator on a rectal swab, which had been previously determined by Bayardo to be negative for sperm and spermatozoa. 
could have been improperly placed there because of improper evidence gathering techniques by Karen Blakely. Could have come from improper handling of the swabs, uh, could have come from contamination issues. There was some semen found, I think, and that could have just dripped down into the um, anal area um, when the body was moved around uh, at the scene and then later moved to the morgue. You, you just can't say that's one of the issues we deal a lot more with these days. Our DNA tests we run today are a lot more sensitive than the, than the ones they ran back, in, back when this, uh, the, these tests were done in this case. Pointing to the victim's injury-free vaginal and rectal areas, the very limited amount of sperm DNA recovered from the victim. Millions of sperms are found in a CC. In this case, just a few sperm heads were found. In Bayardo's incorrect diagnosis of a naturally dilated anus as evidence of sexual assault have led pathologist experts who have reviewed this case to conclude that Stacy Stites was not sexually assaulted. There was no evidence, absolutely no evidence in the autopsy or the findings of the photographs that she had been sexually assaulted. So the question remains, why did Bayardo so critically misrepresent his own report in trial? And how could his medical opinion regarding the sexual assault of Stacy Stites been so wrong? That's one of the areas that initially mistakes are made where the new pathologist, the new doctor coming in, um, hasn't seen anuses in dead people before and that these are, this is perfectly normal and what we're seeing here. Robert Bayardo was not a new pathologist, but it's worth remembering that the Stacy Stites autopsy was one of many lucrative out-of-county autopsies Bayardo conducted to unlawfully augment his salary. An analysis of Bayardo's near three decades in office shows he consistently performed between 395 and 823 autopsies a year. Over time, Bayardo raked in around $2.6 million, performing autopsies for 45 other counties. Did Bayardo falsify his testimony and alter his conclusions to match the prosecutor's false theory of the crime and to appease the county and state officials who continued to hire and pay him? This wasn't the first time that Bayardo's false testimony directly resulted in a wrongful conviction. Other cases include Anthony Graves, who spent 12 years on death row, and Michael Morton, who spent 25 years in prison before each was finally freed and exonerated. Later in the trial, Lisa Tanner then produced additional critical false testimony from state witness and DPS serologist Wilson Young. When asked on the stand by Tanner about the DNA test results from the breast swabs taken from the victim, he reported that he found DNA that matched Rodney Reed. However, the report he references as evidence while testifying indicates that he did not ever test the breast swabs at all. Blatant false testimony that Lisa Tanner would then use to convince the jury that Reed had attacked Stites right prior to her death. Why will testified to a DNA result that he never ran, I don't know. I was looking at what you sent me on the email and there's no DNA result on the breast swab. And maybe he was referring to another report and that wasn't made clear in the testimony. Obviously that's extremely problematic from a lot of points of view, ethical, etc. Again, Rodney Reed did not have an independent medical expert to counter Robert Bayardo's lies and misrepresentations. And his own court-appointed DNA expert, Elizabeth Johnson, had a conflict of interest in this case that should have precluded her involvement in the first place. Elizabeth Johnson had been fired a year before the trial from the Harris County Medical Examiner's Office and subsequently won a $315,000 judgment for wrongful termination, a judgment which was under appeal at the time of Reed's trial. Still, Johnson was appointed by trial judge Harold Towsley, and in her reported results, she only lists six out of 44 items she was required to test, and none of the testing results done on additional suspects. And serious questions remain whether Johnson even ever received or opened critical blood and evidence samples from the state to test at all which would explain why she did not discover the DNA of police officers David Hall and Ed Samella on the swabs of beer cans 
found where the body was discovered, as the state's own crime lab did, as indicated on a lab report that was never provided to Reed's defense at trial. Mere months after the trial, state officials settled Johnson's lawsuit for $375,000. In 2012, 14 years after the trial, Robert Bayardo finally signed a sworn affidavit on Rodney Reed's behalf. On August 13th of 2012, said time of death, if the prosecuting attorneys had advised me they intended to use my time of death estimate as a scientifically reliable opinion, I would have advised them not to do so. Bayardo signed this statement. If the prosecuting attorneys had advised me that they intended to present testimony that spermatozoa cannot remain intact in the vaginal cavity for more than 26 hours and argue that Ms. Stites died within 24 hours of the spermato, spermatozoa being deposited, I would advise them that neither the testimony nor the argument was medically or scientifically supported. And with regard to sexual assault, there is no indication that the spermatozoa was placed there in any fashion other than consensually. Yet, during closing arguments of the trial, Lisa Tanner repeated Bayardo's false testimony to jurors, describing how Bayardo found anal tears that occurred at the time of the death. And she repeated Bayardo's now recanted lie that he found spermatozoa in the rectal area of the victim. Tanner passionately concluded that therefore the sperm was the smoking gun. Based on the false timeline created by Karen Blakely's inaccurate citation of the scientific data on when intact sperm can be recovered after a sexual encounter. During closing remarks, Lisa Tanner also repeats the lie that Reed's DNA was found on breast swabs, proof that tied Reed to the crime, proof that simply did not exist. Unable to use accurate science and honest testimony and without witnesses, a motive, or any other trace evidence, prosecutors were forced to use false testimony and the misrepresented DNA evidence to convince jurors of Rodney Reed's guilt. And sadly, it worked. The state is prosecuting. If their own witness says, you misinterpreted what I said, you misused what I said, I now tell you that that is wrong, it seems to me they have to own that problem and step back from that conviction. This is Thank you. prosecutorial. Thank you. Thank you. Texas judges and courts continue to rely on the now refuted junk science that was incorrectly presented at trial. At this point in time, the prosecution must take responsibility for not having presented the proper evidence, for having allowed improper evidence to be introduced, and how any judicial branch, in this case, the top level court in the state of Texas can not review and accept all of this testimony and stop this planned execution is beyond me. Uh, there's no way in the world that this can proceed. When I told them that I wanted an attorney before I gave them any samples, I told them that in the beginning, and, and when I told them that, they, they shipped me off and moved me to LaGrange, but they brought me back uh, three or four days later, and they wanted me to talk to someone. They wanted me to talk to an attorney. You know, they finally, this three or four days later, and just so happened it was Howard Jenkins, and, and I knew that Howard Jenkins, he's, I didn't think that he was an attorney that could handle this type of case and and I told him I said well I'll talk to him I don't know about having him represent me but I'll see what see what's up well they took me out in the hallway with him and uh, it was just me and him and then first thing he told me he said uh 
He said, right now, I want to tell you something. He said, I respect you then and I respect you now. And I said, well, what's going on? He said, he said, Bastrop is trying to cover their ass. What he meant by that, I don't know. To this day, I still don't know. But, well, I got an, I got an idea, you know, that they are covering their asses. But... <clears throat> On August 3rd, 1996, a little over three months after the Stacey Stites murder, Bastrop police investigator Ed Samella died due to a suspicious gunshot wound to the head. Ed Samella had been part of the Stacey Stites murder investigation. He was one of the first people on the scene of the abandoned pickup truck where he collected the initial evidence and afterwards he accompanied Jimmy Fennell to the wrecker where the truck had been towed so they could examine it together. Two weeks prior to his death, Ed Samella resigned from the Bastrop Police Department and surrendered his guns. Officer Paul Alexander, in an unrecorded interview, told this reporter that he himself confiscated two handguns from Samella prior to his resignation. The local newspaper reported that before his resignation, Samella had been indicted for making terroristic threats to an ex-girlfriend, which was cited as the cause for his forced resignation. The indictment and the incident that caused it have not been verified. The investigation on my brother's death, I do not believe was handled correctly. The Bastrop Police Department came in, understand, and went to the scene and decided that it was one of their ex-police officers or police officers. Therefore, they backed out and called in the Texas Rangers. And by the, the lead investigator on that was a, a man by the name of Rocky Wardlow. Now, I don't know if anybody else knows, but Rocky Wardlow had been going through a divorce uh, a few months earlier and was actually a roommate of my brother. He needed a place to stay. Therefore, I felt Rocky Wardlow should have stepped back as the lead investigator on that instead of going forward with it. I believe that was handled all incorrectly. The only remaining report on Ed Samella's death comes from Rocky Wardlow himself, who assigned himself the lead investigator on the case. In this report, he claims that he was called to the scene by Bastrop police officer David Board. David Board had advised Wardlow that he was on the scene of an apparent suicide at a local Bastrop apartment complex. Scott Samella, Ed's brother, had an opportunity to speak with the neighbor who last saw Ed alive heard the gunshot and called police, as he relayed here in this 2015 documentary released by A&E Television. The neighbor across from him, he said, your brother walked into his apartment. I went back into mine to get some more boxes. He said, I heard a shot. He said, I came out immediately, knocked on his door and hollered for him and nobody answered. He said, I turned the doorknob, it was locked. So he said, I went back in and I called dispatch. He said, I went, opened the door, and there were already three police officers standing in your brother's door, and the door hadn't been kicked open. This account directly contradicts with Rocky Wardlow's report, which states the neighbor waited 15 minutes to call police and omits any information on how police gained access to the apartment. It also makes no mention of the fact that neighbors checked the door and found it locked. Though Wardlow writes that Samella was personally known to him he never reveals in his report or in his trial testimony that he had in fact lived with Samella and at one point he had a key to the same apartment where the shooting took place. A glaring omission of fact and a serious conflict of interest. Wardlow's report and testimony indicate he determined that the death was caused by suicide due to a letter he discovered written by Ed Samella's ex-girlfriend found on the scene and a subsequent interview with that same girlfriend who reportedly told Wardlow that Samella had been calling her repeatedly over the past few days. The letter referred to in this report has never been provided to the Samella family, nor was it ever made available to Reed's defense for verification. And the reported phone messages were erased. I had to do the cleanup after my brother's alleged suicide. The couch was removed from my brother's apartment. They said it was too unsightly for us to see. Um, I got a call from the um, laundromat where there's a young lady who folds clothes, washes them and folds them for you by the pound. Said that my brother dropped some clothes off down there. I went down to pick them up and said that he had arrived 
at the dry cleaners or at that cleaners, it's about seven o'clock, 6.30 to seven o'clock. Dropped them off and said that he would be back in an hour to pick them up because he was going back to Louisiana uh, to see a girl and do a little more gambling because he still had vacation time. And I guess at this time, um, he knew he'd already been fired, but he was getting paid out on vacation. So he was gonna go back there and, and just kind of live it up a little bit. And approximately an hour later, he went to a pulse machine there at the, the bank and had made three transactions for $600, which $200 per transaction. That money and those, those transaction slips were still sitting in his console of his truck. Approximately 30 minutes later, the man's dead. None of this information was included in Rocky Wardlow's investigative report. What was included raises serious questions regarding Wardlow's conclusion of suicide including the fact that Samela was shot on the left side of his head. Uh, my brother's being shot with the left hand is bogus. My brother couldn't do anything with his left hand. He shook too bad. My brother was right-handed. Another disturbing detail of Wardlow's report and testimony is the fact that Ranger Wardlow did not do a gunpowder residue test on the victim at the scene. When asked why he didn't during testimony in Reed's trial, Wardlow claimed his kit was in his other car at his residence. Yet maps show Ed Samello's apartment was a mere three minute drive to the Bastrop Police Department where kits were available. Yet no requests were made by Wardlow for responding officers to bring a gunpowder residue kit for testing on Samella. Later, autopsy reports show that hand wipes were taken at the autopsy, but toxicology reports do not indicate that any hand wipe results were recorded. Nevertheless, Wardlow testified during Reed's trial that the hand wipe results from the autopsy were negative. I mean, the evidence is laying there. I do not believe they investigated anything or they would have found the laundry, the money slips. They, they you know, when an officer or so-called, uh, a soon dismissed officer, I believe should have been investigated a lot more. I think they investigate a, a, a regular homicide more than they, what they would have done my brothers because they came to a conclusion the minute they walked in the door. Wardlow testified during Rodney Reed's trial that he took a vial of Ed Samella's blood to the Department of Public Safety lab for testing for comparison in the Stacey Stites murder investigation. Records indicate that this blood was submitted on August 12, 1996, nine days after Ed Samella's death. Seven months later, on March 13, 1997, with the Stacey Stites murder still unsolved, and just over two weeks before Rodney Reed would be arrested and charged with the murder, Rocky Wardlow requested that the blood of David Hall, Jimmy Fennell's neighbor and fellow Giddings police officer, also be submitted for comparison in the Stacey Stites murder investigation. The Texas DPS lab report by Wilson Young indicates that neither Ed Samella nor David Hall's DNA were found to match any foreign DNA left on the victim, Stacey Stites. Yet David Hall and Ed Samella were both named in a Texas Department of Public Safety lab report that didn't surface until two years after Rodney Reed was convicted as possible contributors to DNA found on two beer cans recovered from the location where the victim's body was found. Rodney Reed and his defense claim they were never provided this critical information at his trial. I feel that Lisa Tanner from the Attorney General's Office, I feel that she put that off in there to make it look like we had knowledge of it. We didn't, we didn't have no knowledge of it at all. My habeas attorney, Bill Barber, she called uh, Lisa to the stand. She said she doesn't recall giving it to my defense, but if she didn't give it to us, her investigator gave it to us. Okay, so then we called her investigator, Missy Wolf, on the stand, and we asked her, did she recall giving it to my defense? And she said, well, she didn't recall giving it, but if she didn't, Lisa gave it. So both of them are saying that they, neither one of them, they're saying they don't recall giving it. And I'm like this, if neither one of them recall giving something that critical, you know, something that important, then they didn't give it. However, District Judge Harold Towsley, the same judge that had presided over Reed's original trial, where he had denied a defense continuance to adequately prepare for the trial and dismissed key witnesses on Reed's behalf from testifying, 
including his alibi and witnesses that could have confirmed he and Stacy's relationship, ultimately ruled against Reed in his post-conviction appeal and issued his opinion that the suppressed DNA evidence would not have changed the jury's verdict. Nevertheless, serious questions remain about the motivation of Rocky Ward Lowe in collecting the blood of Ed Samella and David Hall, considering he ruled both of them out as suspects and specifically testified that David Hall had an alibi, that he was home asleep with his wife, Carla Hall. I've gotten, you know, these, these letters that came out in the paper on DNA, you know, testing a beer can and it having uh, David Hall and Ed Samla's DNA on it. I know everybody's heard that. Number one is I want to know what two police officers are doing drinking out of the same beer can. That, you know, could, to me, that's, that's just absurd. Uh, I feel, I'm not sure, but I feel that could have been placed on the scene for further, if someone got out of line. The use of DNA as a deterrent or a decoy in the Stacy Stites murder case could only have been done by state officials in possession of the evidence, thereby making it extremely difficult to prove. Yet insight into the intimidating practices of the prosecutors in this case are evident in an exchange between Lisa Tanner and Carla Hall, who was a friend and nearby neighbor of Stacy Stites and was married at the time to David Hall, whose DNA was identified on one of the beer cans. I can't recall the year. Had to be between 2001 and 2005. But uh, I was on a phone call with Lisa Tanner and I was questioning it and, you know, I was concerned with the DNA that was found on the beer cans and what that would lead to because of who they said the DNA had belonged to. I just worried about it. And she had made the comment to me, well, you do know that there was a female's DNA found on it and it wasn't Stacy's and it could be yours. Well, no, I don't drink beer. So I kind of started laying low after that comment. That was when I started leaning toward, wait a minute, something's not right here. Mm -hmm. And I never had any other contact with the Texas Attorney General after that comment was made. It came across as a threat, but then I went back and, yeah, it did. It came back as a threat for me to be quiet. What other intimidating or deceptive practices were engaged in by Lisa Tanner and Rocky Wardlow in the arrest and conviction of Rodney Reed? And to what lengths did each go to secure a death sentence of a man whose science now proves is wholly innocent? And what knowledge did Ed Samella have concerning the Stacy Stites murder investigation that could have put him in danger? I remember uh... There was a time where Stacy, she would come with, with marijuana. And I was wondering, where was she getting all this marijuana? And I remember her telling me, Edward. She said, Edward. And I only, I know Ed Samella as, by Ed. You know, when you mention Ed, you say his name, Ed. Everyone know who you're talking about, Ed Samella, which he was uh, over narcotics, you know, the narcotics division down in Bastrop. Um, and when she said Edward, I was, I was thinking, several other people that I know by that name. And it, it didn't, didn't dawn on me that it was him until it came back that he was one of the suspects. And then it, I started thinking, well, maybe he was giving her the drugs to come to me and possibly and then, so that they can say they had me on videotape. They never had me on videotape. The person that they had in videotape was not me. I believe my brother got into something and found out way too much is my feeling on my brother's case. And he was actually sitting back trying to figure out how to go and resolve this and ended up not being in this world anymore. I believe he had some information that was incriminating to maybe some other officers, maybe not in that county or in another county, that actually led to his death. Yes. Myself, I don't believe they have the correct person in prison over the Stacy Stipes murder. And I do believe that if they find out or if 
it's found out that somebody else had killed Stacy Stipes, they'll find out in my mind who killed my brother. Texas Ranger Rocky Wardlow, the lead investigator in the Rodney Reed case, who failed to search the apartment that the victim, Stacy Stites, was last seen alive and that she shared with her boyfriend, the main suspect and former Giddings police officer, Jimmy Fennell. Rocky Wardlow, who returned Jimmy Fennell's pickup truck where the victim's body had been kept, back to Jimmy Fennell, who was a suspect at the time, just three days after the murder, irrevocably losing key evidence and depriving Rodney Reed and his lawyers an opportunity to verify the condition or the contents of the truck or conduct any independent forensic testing on the vehicle from which the state alleges the victim was abducted. And Rocky Wardlow, who failed to do a basic investigation of a suspicious death of investigator Ed Samella, a former roommate of his, a fact that he omits in his written report and in his testimony during Rodney Reed's trial. And Rodney Reed, 21 years on Texas death row, and now weeks away from a state-sponsored execution. An execution by a state who has systematically failed Rodney Reed on every level. An execution that must be stayed immediately, given the evidence which any honest person can clearly see.